All right. So, Ivy thinks that you should know simple common objects that are out in the universe, sizes and numbers and I don't know, there we go, right? So this is the, the uh, overview of the structure of the universe. So let's start with small stuff, right? Okay, class, class. This is our, um, this is our solar system. The rocky terrestrial planets like Earth and Mars and Mercury and Venus, right? Uh, those are all, you know, relatively small area there. Uh, uh, out here is the asteroid belt. It was, you know, was that a planet that was destroyed? Probably not. It's just leftover rocky material that never made it into a planet. We think the current uh, thinking is that Jupiter's gravity prevent, churns it up enough that it never is going to coalesce. Um, and then there's Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. Notice that Pluto uh, is probably not a charter member, certainly, right? Because its, it's, its orbit is, is off the plane of the other ones. The other ones are in the same plane because uh, solar systems come from spinning disks called accretion disks that form around new stars. So Pluto is probably just some big chunk of snow or some ice that got captured from the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt or something like that. Yeah. Why do they form disks? You always see them as kind of... Oh, because if stuff just comes in randomly, right, there's going to be a net amount of angular momentum, right? Because it's going to, as it comes closer, just like those gates at Ibach, right, as you pull in, you spin, right? So if you don't go straight into the center, you go off to the side, you're going to spin, right? And what, what happens is it does this sort of averaging thing. Basically, if you're coming in, if, if everything on the average has this much, as rotating this way, if you come in at this thing, eventually you collide with somebody and you make a disk, right? Isn't that crazy? So disks are ubiquitous. Saturn's got them. New stars have them. Black holes have them. Right? Galaxies are formed in disks like that when they're, when they're young. Older ones are, are more elliptical. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Now, as far as whether Pluto is a planet or not, um, basically my, my take on it is this. If you don't think Pluto is a planet, you're a communist. Okay? And, that's, and, and that's the level of critical thinking that, that I will allocate to that. And that's because Pluto is the only planet discovered by Americans. Right? So why do you hate America so much? Right? You know, uh, and it's it's really pretty funny, um, but I think the best argument for it's not a planet is that it's not really part of that accretion disk that formed the other planets. I don't know that that's the argument they're using. There really are very, very you know there aren't very good objective uh, criteria for saying even that there's nine planets or eight planets, right? So yeah. I would, if asked whether it's a planet, I would say that that it's not. Yeah, they're commies, so. Yeah, so does IB. I would, I would guess that they would try to reflect the current thinking, which is that it's not one of them, but, you know, it's, it's political, right? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it really is. It really is. It gets down to politics, right? Okay. And then this is my favorite mnemonic device, okay, um, is my very elegant mother just sat upon nine porcupines, right? And the beautiful thing about this is there's two things that are beautiful. The first thing is that just the elegant mother sitting on porcupines is a vivid mental image that, that you won't easily get rid of, right? And then the second thing that I like about it is that every now and then it's porcupines nine, which sometimes we say if we need a rhyme, you know? She sat upon porcupines nine, you know, I don't know. It's like poetic speech or something like that. Because every now and then Pluto is, is not the last farthest planet because it's probably not really a planet, right? I was reading that There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! I was like, I will not forget that. <laughs> All right. Uh, the inner planets are pretty close together. In fact, I used to do this scale model. Um, well, we're going to do it. I did this scale model at the Indian school, and we stretched it out over two city blocks, went outside, and I was so far away because nobody really wanted to walk down there and be um, Pluto. So I got to be Pluto. Yeah, so I'm two blocks away from most of the kids, though, are the inner planets, right? And one of the inner planets took out a cigarette and lit it up <laughs> right in the middle of class. But I was so far away that I couldn't tell which inner planet it was, you know. Um, they told me that it, was, they, it caught on fire because it was so close to the sun, right? <laughs> Not that they needed a nicotine fix, but, you know, there it was, right? Okay. So the asteroids, there's Mars. This is kind of-ish the, the size relative to each other that they are. 
Um, and the thing that's interesting about this, one way to think about these planets is that they're small enough that this, Mars is small enough that um, like oxygen and nitrogen and stuff have an escape velocity. They, a lot of it's escaping. Water vapor can escape into space. Um, but certainly hydrogen can escape into space from these planets. Hydrogen is not normally found in our atmosphere, nor is helium, right? Why is that? Well, remember when I had that little shaker model? The, the, I put the big molecules and the small molecules in there. Didn't the big ones go more slowly and the small ones go more quickly? But on the average, they had the same kinetic energy. Remember that idea? Mm -hmm. right? So small molecules in a gas go faster than big molecules, like nitrogen and water vapor and oxygen and stuff like that. right? And so at the Earth's edge, there is the thermosphere, which is a high temperature region of gas. Hydrogen in our thermosphere has a sufficient velocity, some of it, on the tail end there, the really fast ones, have escape velocity. They can escape from the Earth. So helium on Earth is made by radioactive decay. It's what becomes of alpha particles, right? Alpha particles get, get a couple of electrons, go, hey, I'm helium, I'm helium, right? Eventually, it just finds itself in the upper atmosphere, right? And will go off into space, okay? Not so for Jupiter. Jupiter has sufficient gravitational field strength that it captures hydrogen from space, right? So Jupiter is actually gaining weight. Right? It's actually eating up hydrogen that it happens to find in its orbital path. Um, and given enough time, this is, by the way, not considered an or uh, evolutionary trajectory for Jupiter, but given enough time, it could get bigger and bigger and become a star. Not likely that it'll ever happen in any conceivable time frame. But, you know. No, no, it's not a considered an evolutionary you know, path. Right? If there was another star, though, dumping stuff onto Jupiter that it was orbiting, it could do that, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Okay, so here are, here are some outer planets. There's Jupiter. So these guys are, are big enough that they can, they're, they're made of hydrogen. They're, a lot of their mass is hydrogen. They have enough gravitational field strength that hydrogen can't escape from them. Hence the term gas giant. Yes? If you wanted to land on like Jupiter, yeah. is there anything to land on? Deep down, isn't there? They have no surface. They have, deep down, they might have some core of metallic hydrogen or something exotic, right? Kind of like one of those, uh, what are those suckers, the dum-dums, the, the, the oh, Tootsie Pops? Yeah, yeah like yeah. a Tootsie Pop. Oh, yeah, deep it's good to know. There's a rock in there. And if I skied on that planet, I would hit that rock. Did you, ever you know? Like, know? dang, is that one rock. There you go. Pluto, these are fairly to scale with each other. Pluto, though, is tiny. Pluto would be like just kind of like the, the one of the pixels on the screen. I just blew it up. This is some sort of image. I'm very suspicious that it's... I think somebody just took a Photoshop object and just dropped it in there. You know, there we have it, right? And then, then we, if we go beyond that, there's the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud. Okay? That, the double O in Dutch, you actually have to pronounce by inhaling. Right? So go Oort, Oort, Oort cloud. Okay? I actually got somebody last year, and I don't want to embarrass Molly, but somebody said, really? Right? Or, right, okay, it's the or cloud, okay. Um, hundreds of millions of comet-like bodies. It is really big. We are one astronomical unit from the sun. This thing is 50,000 astronomical units in radius. So, so although, although uh, the Explorer spacecraft has left the orbit of Pluto, it hasn't any, gotten anywhere near these guys, right? Uh, ten, total mass is 10 to 100 times Earth's mass, which seems like a lot. It's not really very much when you, when you look at the scale model. Earth on the, on the scheme of things is really a very small proportion of the mass of, of the solar system. What? Uh, gas and ice. Comet-like bodies, so it's, it's mostly gas and mostly ice, right? If you took it out of the freezer for very long, it'd go away, you know? Yeah, like liquid, liquid methane, right? Liquid um, uh, hydrogen or, or solid or gaseous hydrogen, I believe, right? Okay. This is where comets come from. I'm, I'm, I'm ignorant. Does somebody want to tell me what, what are those things made of? Took astronomy? Ice. And is there a rocky core? Yeah. They're, they're, but methane ice, I believe, is one of the things, right? Yeah. Water ice? Okay. This is, um, this is a picture of a comet. Lest we be uh, ignorant about comets, uh, what do we know about this comet? Do we know that it's moving to down and to the left? Could it possibly be moving any direction? It could be moving that way. Here's what we know. We know that the sun is down and to the left. The tails of a comet are made 
by the solar wind, which is charged particles and actual 